Graduate Honors Program. He serves uh, on the Scholars Board of, the, uh, I think they now say Indiana Humanities. It's weird. They now say yes. the Indiana Humanities Council. Right. Uh, the Advisory Board of the Indiana Campus Compacts. I just had a moment there. I'm sorry. And a treasurer of the Indiana College of English, uh, the English Association. His research interest in Lou Wallace began in 2004 when he began volunteering as a docent at the museum. And he also helped significantly with our um, Lou Wallace Youth Academy programming that we did. Um, I've heard a little bit of this talk in a previous program, and I thought it was a previous presentation. I just was really entranced, and it's not that I'm biased about Lou Wallace, but it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> With no further ado, I will turn it over to Jamie. From 1849 to 1861, Lew Wallace made his living by practicing law. Do I need to wait a step? Uh, give me just a second. <laughs> <laughs> no Take <worries>. two. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> by the way, Stephanie did a wonderful, wonderful job with this PowerPoint. We're recording. From 1849 to 1861, Lou Wallace made his living practicing law. As a 22-year-old bachelor, he hung his first law shingle in Covington, Indiana, where he practiced for two years. And then, marrying Susan Elston in 1852, moved his practice to Crawfordsville, where he and Susan raised their son Henry, born in 1853. In his autobiography, Wallace dismisses his 12-year law degree as wasted time. He calls it nothing more than an experimental period of my life in which I did a couple of smart things, but made a lot of mistakes, and mostly pigeonholed those years as defeat. He expressed further contempt for lawyering in a letter to Susan on retiring from his ambassadorship in Turkey and returning to Crawfordsville in 1885. He tells her that he will earn family income in any way except that miserable profession of law. <laughs> Perhaps in his jaded wisdom, Wallace came to the same opinion as Dick the Butcher in Shakespeare's play, Henry VI, who says, first thing we do is kill all the lawyers. <laughs> no, of course Wallace did not want to kill any lawyers, but I do think his, his soul grew morally sick of all the killers lawyers had to deal with. Although <clears throat> Wallace soured on lawyering uh, for whatever reasons, his law career, overshadowed as it is by his many other high-profile legacies, is a story worth telling. The story has historical worth by giving us a snapshot of 19th century crime and punishment as the judicial culture of America, Indiana, Montgomery County, Crawfordsville, was changing from frontier law to modern law. I'll share a little of that story with you this evening in four parts. Part one, hangings. Part two, how to become a lawyer. Part three, how to be a lawyer. And part four, poisonings. <laughs> Hangings. Late in the afternoon of April 12th, 1861, the 34-year-old Lewis Wallace Esquire, attorney at law, was in the middle of prosecuting a criminal case to a jury in the Clinton County Circuit Courthouse when the town telegraph, op um, the telegraph operator burst into the courtroom, interrupted the proceedings, spoke with the judge, delivered an urgent telegram to the attendant sheriff who handed it to Wallace. The telegram read, Fort Sumter has been fired upon, come at once. Oliver P. Morton, governor. With the judge's permission, Wallace turned the case over to his law partner and promptly left the courtroom for Indianapolis, where he was tasked with recruiting Indiana troops to fight, to fight the Confederacy in the coming Civil War, in which, of course, Wallace learned, uh, served as <coughs> general. Morton's order for Wallace to come at once on that fateful April day marked the end of Wallace's career, law career. 
He never practiced again. <coughs> but it didn't end his involvement with the law. He soon found himself entrenched in two earth-shattering capital punishment cases, the likes of which he could never have imagined as a Crawfordsville attorney. <coughs> as an Army general with legal credentials, Wallace was called back to the law in 1865 when the U.S. government appointed him to preside over the trial of the Lincoln conspirators charged with collaborating in the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Wallace led the prosecution through to the conspirators' conviction and execution by hanging on July 7, 1865 at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C. Wallace, by the way, created a portrait, about a copy of which hangs right around the corner in, in, in the gift shop, but of, uh, of, of the conspirators during the trial. For your viewing pleasure. <laughs> the government called Wallace back to the law again in 1865 by appointing him president of the military commission that oversaw the criminal trial of Captain Henry Wirtz, Confederate commander of the Andersonville prison in Macon County, Georgia. Andersonville held some 31,000 Union prisoners, of whom over 13,000 were starved to death, died from injuries sustained by assault and tortured, or unattended sicknesses. Wallace issued the prosecution's verdict, writing, and the court does, therefore, sentence him, the said Henry Wirtz, to be hanged by the neck till he be dead, at such a time and place as the President of the United States may direct. Wallace sent Wirtz to his death by hanging on November 10, 1865, guilty of impairing and injuring the health and destroying the lives of large numbers of federal prisoners in violation of the laws of war. I'd like to read just a very short excerpt from Robert Kellogg, Major Robert Kellogg's book called Life and Death in Prisons, 1865. It's an account from testimonies and Kellogg himself, who was in prison in Anderson, you know, of sort of the conditions which are um, unimaginably horrible. This is, upon, this is upon Kellogg's capture and his men. As we entered Andersonville, the place, a spectacle met our eyes that almost froze our blood with horror and made our hearts fail within us. <clears throat> Before us were thousands of forms that had once been active and erect, stalwart men. Now nothing but mere walking skeletons covered with filth and vermin and dying. And the conditions, of course, go on. But this is a very interesting, interesting and rather historically valuable book of getting a sense of what happened at Andersonville. Enter, excuse me, enter, enter the sensational case of John Coffey that occurred just when Wallace was returning from Constantinople to the back in Crawfordsville. And this is kind of giving us a sense of what hanging was at the time of Wallace. What was it all about? What were some of the big cases? And I just want to go through two, the kind of things that he witnessed. Two outstanding cases suffice. Enter the sensational case of John Coffey that occurred just when Wallace was returning from Constantinople to live back in Crawfordsville. Did I, did I get Stephanie Malkham on, on these? I think so. I think you skipped page three. Oh, okay. <laughs> did I skip one for you? Well, that's fine. We can go back in just a moment. Um, the sensational case of John Coffey that occurred. Um, Coffey was hanged on October 10th, 1885. I'm going to go back to, in just a moment, into uh, a youthful experience Wallace had in 1885. 
Coffey was hanged at the Crawfordsville Rotary Jail under the new mandate of hanging criminals on government property. A farmhand working in the area, Coffey was charged and convicted of the double murder of Mr. and Mrs. Malt McMullen in their home just outside town. A motive was never determined, but one, Mr. But one of Mr. McMullen's friends saw Coffey wearing McMullen's boots, which Coffey claimed he found in a field. Although the trial was filled with doubts, a lot of circumstantial evidence only, Coffey swung. The hanging was botched for the rope boat twice, and the third time it worked. Most condemned criminals probably claim they're innocent, but Coffey was unusually frantic about it, according to those near him at the jail. He constantly screamed, I'm innocent, and even tried to commit suicide by banging his head against the cell wall. He was screaming, I'm innocent so loudly that on the gallows that the sheriff had to put a hood over his head. One thing to take away from, 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 from this hanging in the coffee case, and I'd like to go back to two more in just a moment, to take away from this coffee case is, is the idea of I'm innocent. It's a concept or a ghost that I feel really haunted Wallace throughout his career, indeed throughout his life. The idea is, do we have, have we convicted the right person? Let me, let me backtrack for just a moment. Stephanie, I'm going back now. That's okay. Wallace's, Wallace's life was immersed in hanging. And I think to some degree he was haunted by it. I think that because by, by the amount of detailed and vivid description he devotes in his autobiography to his first big childhood memory, tales of a criminal hanging, or what he calls my first introduction to outlaws. At age five in Covington, Indiana, in 1832, Wallace was mesmerized and frightened by tales of a public hanging a little servant girl told him about that had occurred a year or so earlier, just down the road from the house the Wallace family recently moved into. Wooden posts from the gallows were still laying in the weeds beside the road. She told him of the scaffold, the rope, the noose, the rope, by the way, is from Kentucky, the best rope made, because Kentucky grows hemp, as you know, and also in World War II, the best rope made. And Lou Wallace makes a big deal out of that in his autobiography, that it is Kentucky rope. Um, the frenzied, jeering crowd, the black hood pulled over the man's muffling as he cried, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And she told him about his ghost that reappears regularly on the road at night, pleading, I am innocent, even the locals have heard his voice. That left a lifelong impression on Wallace. But it's also the way that he gives the readers a feel of how much criminal hanging affected individuals and the community long after the event. I believe the ghostly hanged voice of I'm innocent that Wallace experienced as a little five-year-old boy haunted his soul throughout his life, especially in prosecuting the Jonathan Owen case in 1859 that was fraught with perplexing moral problems of how to convince a jury in Crawfordsville that a woman believed to have committed suicide by poisoning is actually innocent of her self-murder. How do you make her ghostly voice from the grave, I am innocent, heard and believed in the Crawfordsville courthouse? How do you convict the right person? How do you exonerate the right person? I will conclude my talk with some of those questions and that case that tormented Lou Wallace throughout his life. Another outstanding case that suffices to exemplify hanging culture, what hanging culture was like in Wallace's day. Now, Coffey is hanged at the Rotary Jail. That wasn't always the case of hanging at the jail or penitentiary. In 1882, when Wallace was serving as ambassador in Turkey, Buck Stout murdered Taylor Dunbar a green grocer in Darlington for two silver dollars. 
Stout's trial was held in Park County, where he was hanged in Rockville's town square. The Stout event marked a major modernization of Indiana law. Because of the extreme crowd control problems on the main street, we understand that there are throngs of people who would come to these hangings, unruly. They would, they, they, they would even sort of like attack the gallows and start trying to take stuff, souvenirs. The little girl tells, tells little, little Lou about this, about people trying to grab the rope at that hanging. They had extreme control problems in Rockville on Main Street. Thereafter, almost directly after, a state law was passed mandating that hangings thereafter would no longer be forms of public entertainment, frontier style, but would be managed on state property, at jails or penitentiaries. Why? To keep unruly crowds at bay, to allow the condemned some dignity, and also, for the first time in Indiana, to give hanging an air of professionalism rather than mob lynching. Rotary Jail, yes. Some facts about hanging. In Wallace's day, facts about hanging in Wallace's day. A hangman was a real paying profession certified by the state of Indiana. Hangmen were paid from $100 to $250 a job in the late 19th century. That's roughly, I don't know, like a couple thousand dollars in today's dollars. Indiana eventually concluded, which a lot of states, and of course in England they had already done this, had concluded uh, to change from what was called the no drop hang to the long drop hang in the 1850s. What is that? Well, the no drop hang meant, I know this is gruesome, but meant just pulled up by the rope, or a short stool kicked out from under you, or as we used to see in the westerns, uh, the rustler hanging at the tree, and they, and, they, and, they, and they kick the horse out from under him. What does that cause? Up to 10 minutes of excruciating strangulation. The long drop, as you, as you would see with the, with the uh, conspirators, uh, the, the long drop, um, what meant a scaffold had to be built, and, drop, and the body dropped four to five feet why? For a very quick neck break. No suffering. No sustained suffering. <laughs> <laughs> well, hangmen were trained to use charts to scale the drop according to body size and weight to prevent the rope from breaking and other problems. Ephraim Griffith, who built the gallows, in, who built the gallows for the coffee for the coffee execution, built the gallows, and it was probably the hangman, although that document isn't clear, but let's just say he was. That obviously didn't work in his case because the rope broke twice and a coffee was hanged the third time. I know that in the westerns that we see, <laughs> if the rope breaks, you get to go free, right? Well, that was, that was out in the West, okay? That was a gentleman's rule in the West. That didn't pertain in this part of the country. Okay, you got, you got, you got, they will try it as many times until it works. I'm sorry, John Coffey, that's not funny. I'm not trying to, memory, a terrible thing. Hangman had to master the physics of using, using harnesses to keep bodies from spinning, and they also had to master, of course, the knot. There's a reason why this knot is used, but I'm not going to go in that to in depth tonight. This is a particular, this is the new sign. By the 1880s, hangings were done on prison property, not main streets, for better crowd control, officiation, and so on. Interestingly enough, hangmen went out of business in 1906. The last year of an execution by hanging in Indiana was 1906. As Indiana, like a lot of states, New York was the first to adopt the electric chair. 
The first electric chair execution was in 1914. And it's kind of interesting to think about Lou Wallace's life from 1827 to 1905. The trajectory of his life goes through the evolution of capital punishment, uh, that is for hanging. <coughs> Public hanging, then prison hanging later in his life, and then right at the end of his life, the electric chair. How to become a lawyer. The calling. Hanging was an integral part of 19th century crime and punishment, but you didn't need to know the ins and outs of hanging to become a lawyer. But you did need to have knowledge of how laws explain why criminals could hang and laws for everything else. Wallace, Wallace was admitted to the bar in February 1849. <coughs> what did that involve? By the time he was 18 years old, in 1845, Wallace settled on his destiny, his life's calling, as law. His older brother, William, had already been studying for the bar with their father in the governor's office in Indianapolis. But for Lou, law was more than just the family thing to do. It was an adventurous calling. He gave, gave three reasons why law was his mission. The big reason, the big reason was drama, making theatrical appearances before the judge, the jury, and the public to win criminal cases with rhetorical flourishes would feed his youthful vanity. As a teenager, Wallace prided himself on his ability to speak loud, fast, and he had a flair for spectacle and flamboyant. Those qualities fit the profession uh, at the time because judicial systems in America were using courts of law to define and implement and spread moral values throughout the country. The main role of the lawyer was to be a great orator, a strong voice for morality. Hence, the Bar Association put great emphasis on the moral character of lawyers and judges. Wallace's second reason was that, in his words, law was a progressive movement in organized society. <clears throat> law and judicial systems lay behind all social energy and progress, from developing, uh, developing towns and intercontinental railways to, to creating local and national commerce. Lawyers help build civilization. His third reason was that law is a stepping stone to politics. And we should know, or I should know, I guess, that Wallace's assumption that lawyers make good politicians is not always universally accepted. But at the time, it really was. Law led to politics. It's a very elite system that comes out of England and Europe. Given the fact that Wallace's father was governor of Indiana, Lou could have attended any law school in America that he wanted to. The William and Mary Law College opened in 1746, the Litchfield Law School of Connecticut in 1774, and our own Indiana Law School in 1842, when Lou was 15. Law school was not necessary for becoming a lawyer. You just had to pass the bar. Law schools were not designed just for learning the law. Their higher purpose, as expressed in the Indiana Law School mission statement of 1842, was to, and I quote, prepare students to combine superior scholarship and ethics. The American judiciary system, not Christian theology, was seen as the nation's leader in setting the ethical values and standards of how we should rightly, civically live not righteously, but rightly as citizens. Hence, the law school focus on ethics. Law was very much a part of the separation of church and state between the spiritual, separation of course, between the spiritual and the judicial. Wallace chose not to attend law school, but to take the more common path of reading law on his own. He entered the world of law through a socially privileged system his father tutored him on law. He had access to costly books in just one moment. 
leisure time away from farm work and other forms of adolescent labor in Indiana to read, to study, to write, to discuss. At an early age, he says, I already learned firsthand the economy of the law office. He attended the Centerville Private School at 13, where he, along with Oliver Morton, became governor. Oliver Morton was four years older than Lou, but they were friends, close friends, actually, for a while. Studied history, language, rhetoric, writing, and the classics under Samuel Hosshauer. In his 1892 book, The History of Education in Indiana, Richard Boone names Hosshauer the greatest teacher in Indiana. Wallace credited Hosshauer as the first and only person who ever encouraged him to write and really taught him how to speak. What really first excited Wallace about the law, speak in public, what really first excited Wallace about the law was his participation in the Youth Literary Society in Centerville School. They spent most of their time reading British parliamentary law, manuals from which the boys would debate political, religious, philosophical issues of justice. A favorite activity of Lou's was moot court, where he could perform melodramatic spectacles of courtroom pleading, which he loved to do. As a teenager, Wallace had little respect for authority, especially lawyers and judges. He published a youthful poem called Travels of a Bedbug in an Indianapolis newspaper. It satirizes the foolishness of an arrogant, drunken lawyer who, drunken lawyer who was a real lawyer and everyone knew who it was. That landed him in trouble with lawyers' friends. When he was working in the office of the county clerk, Robert Duncan, copying records, again, he's a teenager, he made ghost sounds in the lower levels of the Indianapolis courthouse at night to scare judges who were discussing cases. Wallace was caught and severely reprimanded, an incident that the Honorable Isaac Blackford of the Indiana Supreme Court would never forget. However, Wallace later apologized to, to the Honorable Isaac Blackford for this and, and other rudenesses. Um, and, and Blackford apparently forgave the youthful insolence. In preparing for the bar, Wallace, like Wallace, like all lawyers to be, studied Black, William Blackstone's commentaries. Well, that's too small for this. These are Lou Wallace's copies in our library, in, his, in the library here at the museum. Blackstone's commentaries, which were completed in 1769, and Joseph Chitty's Precedence of Pleading, the edition that was used mostly in America was 1808. It came out in the 1790s. Both British. They were adapted by American judicial culture. For what reason? Why, why, would, American, why would American judicial system use, this is the trial of Henry Wirtz that uh, is sitting next to them. Why would the American judicial system, training for the bar, rely so much on British parliamentary law, British common, common law? Common law is precedence, common law is precedence in, in, in Blackstone, the precedence of, 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 of cases going all the way back, going all the way back to the Viking Age. Of, of, of examples of examples like what do you do with a horse thief kind of thing. And then parliamentary law is, of course, the legislation. Good question. <laughs> America had no judicial <laughs> handbooks <laughs> at the time. Blackstone was adopted in 1776. And um, there are 2,200, there were 2,200 sets of Black, Blackstone, excuse me, Blackstone's commentaries um, shipped to Indiana through booksellers in Boston um, in, I think, the first, 15, the first 15 years of the 19th century, so you can see how much it was used. Um, beautiful books to look through, really. Um, they were adopted by American culture, and 
because you know it had no good juridical handbooks of its own. And Blackstone has been used since 1776. Again, it contains parliamentary law, rules of legislative processes, and common law examples and precedents of legal cases. Wabash College also owns uh, a set of the original Black, um, uh, of Blackstone. I'd like to take a moment here and, and say something about the book itself. Just the physical book of Blackstone. Books, books were designed to be carried. They were designed to be portable. They were designed to be mobile. And Blackstone's was perfect. It's, this is a little smaller than the volumes. It's perfect for frontier Indiana with a circuit court because you can easily put those or the copy that you need in your saddlebag or in a bag or in a car, whatever you're doing, traveling around, take it with you to court because they will refer to all the time. They're very durable. This is a book of the of 19th century, it's just Hall's Grammar, it's an encyclopedia. But you look at them, how much they're handled, but yet how, much, how durable they still, they, they really are. Um, and so I just thought I'd pass that around because it's a, just a nice 19th century American book that's used a lot. I think Stephanie found, discovered the trial of Henry Wirtz next to it in, the, in, in our library, which is pretty interesting. I need, I need to read some of that. <laughs> Okay, and Chitty and a lot of other a lot of other books, that's that's what he did. That's what all young men did. They read and studied these and memorized as much as they could. At the Indiana Constitutional Convention of 1850, one year after law, Wallace actually began practicing law, the government contested the Indiana Bar's use of good moral character as a necessary qualification for admission to the bar. Why would the Constitutional Convention question the Indiana, it's called City Bar at the time, their use of moral character as a qualification for uh, passing the bar? Well, they wanted moral, but how do you judge that? Yeah. That was the question that was raised. It's a really interesting debate that goes on in law in Indiana. I'm not sure how it was resolved exactly, but I do know that um, I do know that Wallace must have met the standard, uh, despite his problems with the Honorable Isaac Blackford and others, because he he passed. Okay, all kidding aside, the exam, formal application to to the bar, the testimony of the application. I'm talking about the physical thing that is turned in by Lou Wallace and his class so they can start applying for this. Uh, it's, it, it's like a qualifying exam thing at PhD. Testimony of applicant. One has to swear an oath that I, Jamie Norton, have read Blackstone's commentaries, Chitty's pleading, which has to do with how to plead cases, Parsons' contracts, and there's a list of 10 required works, and they're not all just one book, Many of them are many volumes that uh, prospective, prospective law students had to testify that they have read. Then, I swear I am of good moral character, goes on the sheet. So I, Jamie Norton, swear I'm of good moral character. Then we get a roster of judges, names, and examiners. Then the oral exam is, is set up. The oral exam covering mostly Blackstone and so on is conducted by judges. And then the written exam, five questions, time limit of 16 hours. And that was the bar exam in, in Lou Wallace's day. There might be some case studies were interesting, like, um, I, like case studies from the written, like uh, uh, what was one? Uh, 17, a 17 year old girl is assaulted in a livery stable. Um, and the, 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 owner, the owner who assaults her claims that she was stealing a harness. Uh, she claims he was attacking her. 
So the idea is that then you pull out all your black stone, all your shit, everything else, and you go through with how the investigation should go, circumstantial evidence, substantial evidence, so on and so forth. That was kind of a case study. Okay, how to be a lawyer. In 1849, 22 years old, Wallace was admitted to the Indiana Bar by the authority of the, of the Honorable Isaac Blackford, examining judge. Just a couple years earlier, Wallace failed the exam due to his flippant writing at the bottom of his exam sheet, graded <laughs> by Judge Blackford. Um, that I think we, have, we all have the Judge Blackford in our lives somewhere in the background, don't we? Wallace just couldn't get away from him. Graded by Judge Blackford that he, Wallace, would rather fight in the Mexican-American War than be a lawyer. Well, his wish came true. Blackford <laughs> failed him, and he went to war. Um, now, having recently returned from the war where he witnessed the horrors of mass human slaughter, of mass human slaughter in the Rio Grande under Zachary Taylor's command, and having passed his second try at the bar, he set up a law office in Covington, Indiana, the same place that, at same place at which, at five years old, if we will remember, he was first introduced to hanging by the little girl, and where he would eventually be appointed prosecutor. Yes, this is the announcement for running for prosecution. He would eventually be appointed a prosecuting attorney. So that's, his career was as a prosecutor. He owned only a table a stove, a few law books, copy of Supreme Court cases, a violin, and a dollar seventy-five in cash. But most important, he had ambition. He had no clients. The clerk's office in Covington, his office, had no clients, but he had a plan. This fighting. Frontier. Law style, frontier law style over modern law. What is frontier law? Basically, frontier law meant taking the law into your own hands. Uh, as individuals or mobs. Homespun justice ranged from the backwood lynchings of thieves to gunfights, uh, to gunfights, to, to, to gun feuds, to, to fist fights, to dueling, although dueling was outlawed in Indiana. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, so that's kind of frontier law. Modern law, the way it was seen in the 19th century in history, modern law basically means following the law as it officially led, as it is officially legis legislated. It condemns the lawlessness of homespun justice, like fist fighting. I'd like to come back to fist fighting for just I will for just a moment, but I'd like to give you a sense of frontier law of 1836. This was the year that Lou Wallace was uh, nine years old, and had David Wallace, his family, had moved to Crawfordsville from Covington, so Lou was living here. Um, and it's, it's the murder, it, 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 in 1836, Moses Rush was hacked to pieces by his wife with uh, a long ax in their cabin where Indian Creek meets uh, Sugar Creek. Uh, in the day, Frontier law was partly, partly governed by resources, determined by resources. In the day, constables, sheriffs, law enforcement simply didn't have the resources, the resources of the facilities for investigating, arresting, processing those who were offenders. This is a big county. And sometimes you just have to let things go, right? And frontier law, kind of, it was kind of accepted, accepted that sheriffs and constables could use their own discretion in whether they wanted to arrest somebody or not. And I can see why that was the case. Well, she hacked him to death. He was drunk, by the way, uh, drunk in their cabin. And he was known as a drunk and a nuisance, a town troublemaker, this, this Moses Rush. So listening to uh, the, the locals, which is what sheriffs did, the locals all say, good riddance. Good riddance to this guy. He was abusive. So he was buried, 
uh, by an oak tree with his name on the oak tree out there, and just forgotten. And that's the kind of way that frontier law could operate in a good way. So um, Mrs. Rush got rid of an abusive husband and didn't have to pay the consequences. <laughs> Fist fighting. By the way, that became a picnic area for Crawford's Billions. <laughs> um, that's local lore, but I've read that many times. It's Moses Rush's initials were carved in a large oak tree with a skull and crossbones, and it became a favorite picnic place because his mutilated body was buried somewhere <laughs> over there. I've never found the location. I've asked around and see if anybody would. It'd be interesting to find it someday, but I can imagine the young Wallace at nine one Saturday heading out to the, the tree. <laughs> fist, fist fighting rather than litigation was favored frontier way of settling a score. As Ted Granite points out in his local history Sugar Creek Saga, uh, while personal combats characteristic of the frontier were less frequent after 1865, they were a primary, primary means of justice in early Montgomery County. It was cheaper and faster than going to court, filled with legalese language no one understood. In his history of Montgomery County, 1913, A.W. Bowen observes that early fighting in Crawfordsville was frequent. From the founding of Crawfordsville in the 1820s through the 1840s, fist fighting to settle legal disputes were held in a designated alley in town on Saturdays with witnesses, including the sheriff. Whoever won the fight was declared by the sheriff to be the winner of the dispute. As a young lawyer in the frontier region of Covington, Wallace knew that following the local ways, good old-fashioned frontier style, could spell success for an educated city boy out of Indianapolis with a privileged background. He reasoned these are his words, Wallace's words. He reasoned that the people of Fountain County were the original settlers, the primitive, the, the primitive inhabitants. Instead of taking quarrels to court, they settled them on the spot, resorting to their fists. Lawyers might be dishonest, scoundrels, greedy liars, and even thieves, Wallace says. But the one thing their respectability could not survive was the rep of a coward. So Wallace needed frontier style, front, Wallace needed frontier style respectable reputation in town. So he concocted a scheme with a local sheriff, a fist fighting man himself, to get into a fist fight with the delegate at the Constitutional Convention in Covington in 1850. The scheme worked. Wallace got into a fist fight in public over political issues, was charged with assault and battery, screamed, I'm guilty to the crowd in front of the crowd. The sheriff found him $5. And Wallace says, and from that day on, I had business. And Wallace says, sooner, soon, the lawyer with the best docket in the county offered me a partnership. So, in frontier time, frontier style, fist fighting meant bravery, and it also meant a fistful of dollars in hands. <laughs> Wallace's Covington desk. As a practicing attorney, the mature Wallace, of course, moved <coughs> from fist fighting to advocating modern law, as most lawyers did. Uh, from over frontier law. And he celebrated the value of law and order as American justice evolved into securing a civil society. His, his very progressive attitude is evident in his reflections on the legal contributions of such uh, notable uh, jurisprudence scholars and, 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 and movers as Benjamin Harrison and Peter Kennedy. Kennedy, a noted Indiana lawyer uh, up, from, up from Kentucky who served in the early part of the century. Wallace's, Wallace's view, Wallace viewed Peter Kennedy as the revolutionary in revolutionizing old law of frontier Indiana into modern law. Courts had long been hampered by old rules, loopholes, poorly defined procedural methods, 
and the tricks of what Peter Kennedy called backwoods pedophagery. <laughs> Kennedy's reforms, <laughs> which Wallace embraced and implied in his own legal work in the courtroom, focused on giving priority to concrete merit of the case, a, fa a phrase coined by Kennedy to simply mean, well not simply, but to mean using tangible, objective evidence over subjective whims when pleading in a court of law. Inspired by Kennedy's merit of the case principle, one of Wallace's significant contributions to modernizing court trials, modernizing court trials, involved improving people's memories. One of the biggest challenges for a prosecuting, for the prosecuting bench, according to Wallace, uh, at criminal trials, is the memory of witnesses. Mm -hmm. Indiana courts had not as yet adequately, systematically addressed the problem, and they sure hadn't in Covington and Crawfordsville. For Wallace, forgetfulness of witnesses in courtroom proceedings was really a holdover from frontier days when people just gave their word without writing anything down. It was a common habit for courts not to write anything down about what the witness had said. Without a rational system of record keeping, witnesses, many of whom were illiterate and or very poor of speech, often randomly changed their stories, forgot what they said the last time, or complained that the courts just misunderstood what they were saying <laughs> or misheard them. The memory problem, this really, this, this is really interesting, Wallace, this is fascinating. The memory problem often put prosecuting attorneys like Wallace at a disadvantage. The criminal suspects often got off free because of poorly kept witness testimonies. Besides that, testimonies in courting, recorded in writing, recorded in writing, would give prosecutors opportunities to find contradictions or weaknesses that could further their own case. The remedy, Wallace said, consisted in carefully entering in a journal the testimony as given, reading it to the witness in the presence of the jury and then requiring him or her to affix his signature to the statement. That sounds like a simple thing, but it was a big move and Wallace was really behind that. In the, in, in the circuit courts of doing that. He did it himself, his team did that. In the next, so that in the next court session, the transcript could be read back, back to the witness so that any change in testimony would result in perjury. He says that work was heavy, but very, very profitable to the advancement of the legal system and the prosecuting attorney's office. This is probably one of those smart things that Wallace lists as his meager career accomplishments. Another part of being a lawyer in the 19th century was serving as teacher for those interested in and preparing for the law. Wallace practiced at a time when Indiana law was developing and implementing formal apprenticeship systems across the state. Internships in law offices, as Wallace did as a teenager in Indianapolis, often involved mainly busy work, though they were learning experiences. Law apprentices, law apprenticeships were more. The, um, based on the age-old practice of kids apprenticing to a trade to learn the ropes, um, the, the, the law, law apprentices gave prospective lawyers experience ranging from financial office management to how to interview witnesses and so on and so forth. Basically, law office apprentices were assigned high-end high paralegal work for learning the nature of court cases. I'm, I'm saying this because this is one of the roles, this is what it means to be a lawyer, to be a part of this in, in 19th century. I don't know if it is today or not. For instance, Meredith Nicholson, born in Crawfordsville in 1866, apprenticed to William Wallace's law office in Indianapolis to prepare for the bar. Nicholson did not become a lawyer, but instead parlayed his apprenticeship into becoming a crime reporter, a very famous crime reporter, by the way, and to become one of Indiana's most famous, pop, most famous novelists of the, of the era, publishing 21 novels, many of which have to do with crime and punishment. 
The apprentice system also included the good old fashioned volunteer work to help out young men, many of whom lacked educational resources in preparing for the bar. An example, in the early 1850s, Lou Wallace helped Thomas Davidson, a, par, a poor farm boy from Hillsboro, in just that way. Davidson frequently rode to Crawfordsville on his horse, where Wallace, would, when he was practicing the Crawfordsville, of course, Wallace, Wallace would lend him his law books, including the commentaries. Very valuable. Every few weeks, the two met on Saturday, and Wallace would quiz Davidson on what he had learned. Davidson became a Crawfordsville lawyer and eventually went on to become one of Indiana's most prominent judges, always crediting his success to Wallace's generous mentoring. So the value of mentoring is very much a part of, 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 of this development into, into modern law. <coughs> So I would like to make one point. To be a good lawyer meant to be a good orator, a speaker. Elocution, oratory, that was the prime key. And Wallace used, uh, used modeled himself author a lot of really good legal orators in Indiana. He talks about that. He used their style to mentor himself to become a powerful speaker. Like, for example, Senator Edward Hannigan, attorney in Covington, who Wallace witnessed in the courtroom. Hannigan had a reputation for impromptu speaking, really good. In other words, in a court of law, if you're thrown off, you have to be ready to get back into the argument in some way. Um, and, and, and Wallace would watch Hannigan in his, in his, in his skill to defend, to defend or to prosecute and, and, and to win case after case with his eloquence, his, his rational arguments and so on. And this really left an impression on Wallace. But again and again in his autobiography, he comes back to public speaking, which we had that today in politics, public speaking as the most, one of the most important moral points of communication is how do we talk in public. To be a prosecuting attorney in 19th century America meant that you would likely see about every misdemeanor and felony imaginable spawned from the creative minds of miscreants ranging from con artists to blood, cold-blooded killers. Murder by poison was one, and it could wrap up common artistry, cold-blooded killing, into one messy package. Part four, poisonings. If you poison us, do we not die? It's a quote from Shakespeare. <laughs> This is the Crawfordsville Courthouse? Yes. This is the second, second, second courthouse, right? Yeah. The Crawfordsville Courthouse, or courthouses, has hosted many spectacular criminal trials, such as the case of John Coffey. Two of the most spectacular were those of Jonathan Owen in 1858 and William Pettit in 1890. Spectacular because both involved poisoning, a crime that possesses enormous challenge to the prosecutors and to the defenders, to the prosecution and to the defense. Wallace led the sensational, the prosecution for the sensational uh, criminal case of Jonathan Owen in, in 1858. And the Ladoga map is here just to place us because Owen owned an enormous uh, acreage and was a well-known farmer in the Ladoga area, just outside of Crawfordsville, of course. Owen was a prominent farmer and a, long, and a, and a landowner in the Ladoga region, but Wallace wanted Mr. Owen hanged in the worst way because he wanted to exonerate 
Mrs. Owen from the public belief that she had committed suicide to make her dead voice heard, I am innocent. Wallace was equipped, and we're gonna get into that case in a moment. Wallace was well equipped to take on this case. In his encyclopedia, The Bench and Bar of Indiana, 1895, John Taylor wrote that in the late 1850s, Crawfordsville had one of the most noted bars in all of Indiana, boasting some of the best talent. Henry Lane, Samuel Wilson, jo Joseph McDonald, John Butler, Robert Harrison, and especially Lewis Wallace, who Taylor calls a highly gifted prosecuting attorney then in his prime. Let's go to the cases, or to, to, to poisoning. In his commentaries, in his commentaries, Blackstone, in the commentaries, Blackstone says, of all the species of death, the most detestable is that of poison, because it can, of all, this is an 18th century language too, right? It be least prevented by either manhood or forethought. Blackstone goes on to say that you cannot protect yourself against poisoning because it is often done by persons closest to you and done in such a manner that you can't detect, especially in food and drink and the sustenance of life. Poisoning is a premeditated deed done by secret evil design without witnesses except the foul doer of the deed who will lie. Blackwell says that ancient Celtic common law sentenced poisoners to be boiled alive. <laughs> the criminal case, I'm going, to do, I'm going to do two cases together here. Two poisoning cases. The criminal case of the Reverend William Pettit, charged with murdering his wife by poison in 1890, brought back Blackwell to life and grabbed Wallace's attention. Now, he's no longer, Wallace is no longer practicing in 1890. <coughs> in Wallace's attention on that haunting question of who is innocent. By all accounts, Pettit was an upstanding Christian man, a local Methodist minister, member of the Midwest, Midwest Methodist Conference, and a director of the battleground Camping Association. The Methodist Church expelled him, however, uh, from the ministry on insider reports that he was having an adulterous affair with a young woman of the church. But that was the least of Pettit's worries. <laughs> when his wife was found dead, his wife's death drew the coroner's suspicion, and he was eventually indicted for murder by poisoning. The Pettit trial convened at the Crawfordsville Courthouse in 1890 and became one of the most reported criminal cases across Indiana newspaper history. The Crawfordsville Journal published umpteen articles following every detail of the event, including biographies of all the attorneys involved. It also advanced what came to be known as, as, as sob sister journalism. That is, journalism that devotes great attention to interviewing the victim's relatives, in deep mourning, such as a sister, <laughs> so, that, uh, so as to sway public sympathy for the victim and hatred toward the accused. Our newspapers were interesting. They took sides in Crawfordsville. They were very political back then. Uh, maybe they still, it is still. Um, anyway, uh, the journal praised prosecuting attorney A.D. Anderson and turned him into a celebrity because despite having only, only a circumstantial evidence and hearsay to rely on, built such a rhetorically brilliant and convincing case based on the accused, Mr. Pettit, Reverend Pettit, illicit love motivation as to secure a conviction of life in prison. And we have to understand it's very difficult to determine poisoning. So this was really, really an important case. The defense had argued that Pettit's love affair was motive for his wife to commit suicide by poison and thus 
he was innocent, the prosecution, Anderson, argued that Pettit's love affair was the motive for his poisoning his wife, and thus he was guilty. The prosecution won. Pettit was sentenced to prison. Wallace paid close attention to this, this, the, the Pettit prosecution. Why? Because it involved poisoning. The same evil design, in Blackwell's words, the, 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 the evil design, that plagued the Jonathan Owen case that Wallace lost 30 years earlier. His last big case as prosecuting attorney, that one that no doubt led to his calling his career a defeat. What's really interesting about this is that in one of the journals, one of the journal's crime reporter noted in an article this is a quotation from the article, that Lou Wallace is expected to write a novel based on the tragedy. Now, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know if there's more history behind this statement than what meets the eye. Um, what I do know is that that really aroused my curiosity to think back from this poisoning case that Wallace was apparently very interested in, to think back to the original Jonathan Owen poison case that Wallace was involved in and prosecuted many years earlier. I will say this as we go on. Had Wallace written a crime novel out of that, I think it would have been extremely, extremely profitable. Crime fiction in America and especially in England was a huge seller at this time. After all, this is the era of Jack the Ripper, right? Uh, the East London Murders, 1888. The Indianapolis Star is publishing articles on Jack the Ripper. Um, this is the time of Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, which were blockbusters in 1887. And the list goes on and on and on. Joanne Acabella, in a, in a very interesting book called Murder by Poison, it's just a book you guys can't resist this title. <laughs> uh, she's a contemporary scholar, very a cultural scholar, very interesting. By the late 19th century in England and America, she says there was an epidemic of arsenic and strychnine poisoning. Arsenic in England, strychnine in the United States. Poisonings. In fact, the courts were filling up with poisoning cases so much that they actually were competing with the other kind of standard murder cases, like shot in the head or knifed, according to her data, that it, right at the end of the 19th into the 20th century. Um, and she notes that the epidemic of poisoning murder cases really began to test the limits of the legal system, because for the first time, in the legal system in America and in England, they really had to start to deal with forensic chemistry. And that became a source of evidence. And that was new in history. In any case, I think had Wallace thought about that, he probably did give it some thought, that the kind of novel would have been very publishable in America at the time. The Pettit case, of course, had all the ingredients. It's got lust, it's got betrayal, it's got murder by poison, it's got a moral fall of a Methodist minister, it's got the social ruin of a young church girl caught up in an affair, it's got a dead married, so on and so forth. It has all the ingredients of a really great crime fiction. And besides that, poison is the uh, poison is the silent, the silent killer. On December, on a December day in 1885, Owen, Jonathan Owen was, Jonathan Owen found his wife, Mrs. Owen, dead in their house a few miles outside of Crawfordsville near, near, uh, near the uh, Owen, Owen reported to authorities that she died of a heart attack. He buried her on the property the next day and the cause of death forgot. Of course, you get those bodies buried quick, right? in December, though. But Mrs. Owen's local relatives grew suspicious and demanded that the court 
ordered her body to be exhumed for further forensic analysis through autopsy by a certified medical examiner, which is the first time that this was ever done in Provincetown, and in Montgomery County. She was exhumed, examined, and sure enough, forensic tests proved that she died of strychnine, rat poisoning. The coroner concluded death by self-inflicted toxin, supported by her, she, she drank it, supported by her friend's testimony that Mrs. Owen often threatened suicide because of her unbearable situation of living with her terrible stepchildren. But to a good lawyer like Wallace, that kind of hearsay doesn't constitute objective proof. Besides, he was well versed in Blackstone's haunting legal philosophy that poisoning is premeditated deed done by secret evil design without witnesses except the foul doer of the deed who will lie. Could Mr. Owen be one of those foul doers of the deed? The plot thickens. During the days of, of his wife's autopsy, Mr. Owen managed to sell his Ladoga farm and make it to Canada. <laughs> where his teenage children, his nasty teenage children, went, nobody knows, nobody knew. When it was determined that Mrs. Mrs. Owen died of strychnine and discovered that Mr. Owen had left for Canada, Montgomery County law enforcement wired Canadian officials who apprehended him on a warrant returning the cuffs with an armed guard to Montgomery County. Owen was charged with what seemed like a clear-cut case of spousal murder, an international flight from justice. But things aren't always what they seem, and here's what happened. The defense counsel for Mr. Owen comprised some of the best legal minds and lawyers in Indiana. Samuel Wilson, Joseph McDonald, James Wilson, and Daniel Voorhees, who led the defense. Voorhees was out of Co Covington, and, and he and Wallace had battled each other in court before. Wallace was actually intimidated by Voorhees' rhetorical skills and his rough and tumble courtroom style. Wallace called Voorhees the gladiator. <laughs> the prosecution counsel against Mr. Owen comprised an, equally, an equal formidable group of lawyers, R.G. Gregory, Robert Harrison, and Lou Wallace, then in his prime. He led the prosecution. It was thus Wallace versus Voorhees. The more I study this particular courtroom drama between these two contentious lawyers, the more I think of it as some kind of backstory to the chariot race and then her. <laughs> the two fought their chariot race in front of a jury of 12 men. The dead Mrs. Owen was at an immediate disadvantage. <laughs> because she never earned a reputation as a woman of stellar moral character in the Crawfordsville community. In fact, she was considered a woman of low character. She was Owen's second wife, his first died. She was a suspect already, sort of like in that culture, you know, really. She was much younger, and she had, and, and, and much younger than he, and known for constantly fighting with her stepchildren. She was known to throw fits, screaming that her stepchildren tormented her so that she wanted to kill them or kill herself. She was seen unfit. She was seen as an unfit mother, irrational, hysterical. Not a good picture in front of a jury of 12 men. Mr. Owen, on the other hand, carried a reputation of man of stellar moral character. He ran a profitable farm, considerable acreage. He was a hardworking, honest, good financial standing with the bank. He was a beloved member of the Ladoga Church congregation. What's more, he suffered the tragedy of his first wife's death and as a responsible father, married, married again so that his children would have a mother. A good picture in front of a jury of 12 men. Borges mounted a very strong argument for Mr. Owen's innocence based on his moral character. And this, and this uh, that that Mr. that moral character, that Mrs. 
Mrs. Owen, excuse me, Mrs. Owen was suicidal of unsound morals and mind. Wallace argued against Voorhees' subjective position that because Mrs. Owen mentioned suicide, she committed suicide. Wallace was deeply schooled in the juridical work of Peter Kennedy, and we remember his, we remember his merit of the case. Concrete, objective, evidence only. No whims or feelings or attitudes. Wallace's merit of the case, that is his argument against Voorhees, just got buried. As the defense featured an array of Montgomery County's most esteemed citizen who testified to Owen's moral character and against his wife's suicidal tendencies. Attitude is stronger than evidence and perception is stronger than truth. One piece of merit of the case evidence Wallace did have was the bill for the strychnine that Mr. Owen had purchased at the Ladoga drugstore apothecary days before his wife died. His signature was on it. Problem was, Owen already acknowledged buying the strychnine, claiming his wife asked for it to kill rats in their house. Looking back, this was in the trial, looking back, Owen said, I just realized my wife deceptively wanted it for killing herself. I never saw any rats in the house. <laughs> Wallace and his dean discovered that, one thing they discovered, so that evidence is Wallace and his team discovered that Mr. Owen almost always paid cash for purchases. He didn't like to keep bills at stores, not the drugstore. So why then would he put a cheap bottle of strychnine on a drugstore bill with a signature and date on it if he's going to kill use to kill his wife? Surely he would know that the authorities would find it, tying him directly to the murder. Or was the bill the oldest con in the book? Put incriminating evidence right in front of everyone's eyes so it looks like normal stuff. Yeah, it was convincing to the jury. What about the crux of the case? The incriminating fact that Mr. Owen fled to Canada as soon as he learned his wife's body would be exhumed for examination. Does that draw suspicion? Yeah. <laughs> we have to be careful about that because, I mean, it could be just circumstantial. Yes, it does. Here's where Borges' dissent defense team was absolutely brilliant. They cited a section from Blackstone's commentaries that describes many, many cases of people <clears throat> who thought they looked so guilty in a crime that they didn't, crime they didn't commit, that they panicked and ran away, looking even more guilty. It's a psychological thing in Blackstone. Case after case of innocent people doing this. Well, that's what the defense claimed happened to Owen. He, he knew he looked guilty, so he panicked and he ran to Canada. They bought him. Waltz's prosecution collapsed and fell apart in the end. It was decided that Mrs. Owen had the motive to kill herself. Mr. Owen had no motive to kill her. He was innocent of murder. She was guilty of self-murder. Owen was freed and immediately left the state and was never heard from again. <laughs> Wallace lost the case, and he eventually lost interest in the legal profession that had to deal with killers. By then, 30 years later, would the Pettit poisoning case reawaken his interest enough to think about writing a story about it? Well, let's just conclude with this. I think one of the answers is that the Pettit and the Owen cases are the exact inversions of each other. The one prosecution of victory the other prosecution of defeat. The prosecutor, Wallace, lost the conviction for poisoning. The prosecutor, Anderson, won a conviction for poisoning. Wallace lost because he had only circumstantial evidence. Anderson won 
using really only uncircumstantial evidence. Owen went free, Pettit went to prison. Wallace failed to clear Mrs. Owen's name from being a suicide, but Anderson was successful in clearing Mrs. Pettit's name from being a suicide. Perhaps in the victorious Pettit prosecution for poisoning in 1890, Wallace relived his defeat in the Owen prosecution for poisoning in 1859. Wallace, after all, did sum up his 12-year career as a defeat. The voice of justice, I'm innocent, that haunted Wallace from the ha from that hanging in, in Covington all those many decades earlier when he was five, was the voice of Mrs. Owen that he failed to redeem. I see Wallace's life here not as a defeat, but the picture of a man with a deep moral conviction to always do the right thing for justice, as he had so much sought to do for Mrs. Owen. Any questions for Jamie? <coughs> One of the things I noticed is that Wallace did not like being an attorney, but he had the utmost respect for the law. He really, yeah, uh, yeah. That's one of the reasons he went into the war um, was because he felt it was um, almost a legal issue to keep the country together. And as a side note to Mr. Pettit, he didn't serve very long. I think he was released from prison pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how <coughs> do you think the fact that uh, it was a, a woman against a man in each of the cases? A lot. So, <laughs> I too, Elizabeth. Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, that's not very historical. That's not a very good response. But um, I, I think that's, I think in the documents that I've read, when, when, when could come to that conclusion mm -hmm. fairly rationally say there is definitely some of that. Yeah, well, come on, the male law was very bad. Were and um, you know, oftentimes women were, like I said, an immediate disadvantage. They were just disadvantaged because they were lesser people anyway. Um, and the thing with Ted, and maybe Larry can confirm this on me, but the, the thing with, um, well, with, with, with Owen, with Owen, excuse me, um, is that he had a lot of male, prominent male friends in town, all the leading citizens of. Crawford male these citizens were buddies. And so, you know, in a case like this, that could really, really go for, go 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 in his favor. Do we know which he probably did. The, 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 the news, local newspaper says that, that, that basically basically this whole thing was just a setup. It's just it, it's just because of who Owen knew that he that he got off. Was Mrs. Owen a resident of Montgomery County yes. before she married him? I'm not sure before she married him, but she had relatives in Montgomery County. That would be interesting to know. The thing is, as you would know really well, getting into these court cases, it's, you know, there's so much that's not there. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, Crawfordsville is keeping death from birth records. I mean, it only started, what, in the 1880s? I mean, I, I wanted to find more about their deaths, but there are no death records here going back before that time, so, or birth records. They must be somewhere, but I don't know. There, there were two other uh, murder cases that Wallace would have been at least a little bit aware yeah, of. Yeah. Um, one in Pendleton, when the Indians were massacred and the yeah. whites were prosecuted for their murder, he had an uncle who was on the um, defense and lost in that. And the other one was the uh, Mrs. Clem murder trial in Indianapolis in the 1850s, maybe. Yeah. It was the first time a woman was um, prosecuted, I think, in Indianapolis for a double murder. She mm -hmm. supposedly murdered a, her business associate, a man, and his wife. And he had um, a member of his family was was part of that trial as well. Well, Elizabeth, too, I you know the Rotary Jail, 1882. Yeah, right? yeah. mm -hmm. Two of the, two of the cells were women, for women. So, Women in crime, 
I mean, America was starting to have to deal with that at some at some level, rather than just pitching women in these you know, prisons. Um, I don't know what to make of that in terms of your question, but that's always interested me too. Um, and of course, crime was very much on the rise in, in, in Crawfordsville. I mean, it was a, it was a crossroads from Chicago, and so you know, a lot of opium passed through here, a lot of things. There was a lot of crime. It's very interesting. What we consider crime. Prostitution, um, you know, illegal, illegal alcohol, and things. Because we think that we're, you know, we think, well, it, you know, here we are in Crawfordsville, just away from everywhere else. Well, not in that, not in that day. I mean, this was a hopping metropolis. That was a, well, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a central location across the United States. Jamie, I think there's a couple of questions that came in on the computer. On the computer? Yeah. Yes. We're at market here. <laughs> we, um, we had uh, someone who wanted to know, um, I've lost them, <laughs> what, what biographies, do you know of any of the Wallace biographies that touch on his legal career? And do you know if there's a project to collect his legal papers? Um, no, number one, most most of his, this is not a good answer. Are they watching me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Larry, Larry's better at this than I am. Welcome I, to Internet Most Starving. of his biographies, except the really thin ones, biographical material will make some reference to his law career. I mean, it is there, but not much. Very, very little. The Morris Berger book has kind of a chapter called The Law and the Lady. And it's mostly about the lady. <laughs> oh, that's, right. that's what got me interested in this project many years ago. And in Indi uh, the uh, Indiana History Magazine, 1949, mm -hmm. John Forbes, I think, wrote an article in which he said, Lou Wallace was a terrible lawyer. He didn't amount to anything. Um, and I, that really, I thought, I was just leaving through these. I thought, well, that's interesting. I'd like to look into that. So I can't really answer that first question. Um, I have... Um, I, 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 back a while ago, I can't remember at the Indiana Historical Society, I can't remember her name. She used to be in Crawfordsville. Tamara. Tamara. Okay. I, knew her, I knew her. Sorry, that was very embarrassing. I, I was in contact with her about, about a lot of these documents because whoever asked that question, I was interested in that. No, it's not her fault. I kind of got the runaround. Like, it was sort of going up on the internet and well, sort of going on digital and sort of on this and that and I just I really just gave up the Wallace and papers. I have not been back to that research yeah. for six probably five years the Wallace papers are online but well, they're hard to use yeah I find they're hard go. to use but I don't know what kind of papers have been you know brought to bear from Fountain County and you know if he did anything in Tiffany County. Yeah, well, County. they could do that. You could so, go that route too, but I'm not very good at answering that second question. So not, I think not. <laughs> Betty. I, I find it very interesting that Indiana passed a law about where hangings had to be. Yeah, it is, mm -hmm. it is. I mean, because, you know, if you read the Pulitzer Prize, uh, you know, the Underground Railroad, and it's just so horrible, it depicts hangings. I yeah. mean, what year did we say that hangings had to be in public places? Well, not just a tree somewhere. Right. My the understanding. My understanding is that I mean, they probably were done on prison, but it was really after the um, the Taylor Dunbar um, murder. The, the 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 hanging in in in, uh, in 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 Park County that was so unruly. That authorities decided. Is that the one that you talked about? That's the one. Excuse me. That's the one I talked in about. In 1850, yes. that he heard about that. When yeah, he it was. Um, I'm sorry, 1835 or something. It was actually no, not that one. That was much, much earlier. Okay. And that was in uh, that was in Covington, when Wallace was five years five old. Five years old. Um, I think we're talking about the uh, Buck Stout. The Buck Stout murder of, of Dunbar in Darlington, when Buck Stout was hanged in uh, Park County, that became a that was a very unruly uh, hanging uh, in somewhere somewhere in the city, somewhere like on Main Street or something. Okay. And it was after that that Indiana moved to more hangings on on, on jail jail property. 
And, and these are hangings as opposed to lynchings, which... Oh, I didn't mean, they're not lynchings, but I think the idea, I think part of the idea was, and I can kind of see this, that with, with, with mobs, mobs, mobs around the hanging, it, it can have the feel of a lynching, at least. It's not, but I can see how right. it can have the feeling, and there's also the feeling that one, or we want to at least extend some dignity to the condemned. Mm -hmm. At least some, and I think that they were, I think Indiana was saying that it, it just wasn't. So that was one of the reasons. Well, it's, maybe that's frontier and, law. It's part of frontier law. Yeah, it is. Well, I, I saw it. In, yeah, it's sort of it's sort of the movement from frontier law to modern law to because execution. When you see the people hung after the Lincoln, still did. Yes, in Crawfordsville. Oh, yes, we could. Yes, we we could walk down to the Rotary Jail and watch uh, John Coffey hang. We could do that, but the thing is that that's 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 property that's owned by the state or the city that we're on and he's on. So the idea is that the authorities felt that they had more control over the crowds just in that case, rather than if it was just down here on on Wabash Avenue, um, in front of Frank's house. We could, you know. <laughs> We could, you know, just gather around and things like that. So I think that was part of it. Um, there was some thought about moving them in, and uh, penitentiaries were they were in existence begin, yeah, then. They, were, they were in existence, yes. But we're still moving toward a centralized penitentiary system in Indiana, which really wasn't in place quite at the time. But then they moved a lot of the hangs to the penitentiaries, and then eventually they disappeared from public viewing. The hangings for the um, Lincoln conspirators and for words very tightly controlled yeah. and yeah. not available to, for public yeah. viewing. Yeah. So you could put up barriers and things uh, the authorities to keep to keep people out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I realize how how gruesome that is, and, and maybe you know it's kind of difficult. Well, I don't know if it is. I mean, people are really attracted to stuff like that. They always have been. <laughs> You know, they, in a small, you know, these were huge events. In, these were huge events in Montgomery County. People will come from literally miles around and spend, you know, two days here for a hanging. Well, I think that's why the books. Are, and, that's why the books are sell so well. Yes. Yeah. That's why that, the fiction sells so well. That, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree. It does sure. Well, we don't want to call it too short, but thank you, That's Jamie, and he'll be around if you have any questions.